So man's number in the Bible is going to be six. That's what you're going to find out. In Bible numerics, the number six is the number of a man. Notice verse 18, and his number is 600, so that's the first six, three score, that's 60, that's the second six, and six. So notice 666, that's 666. Six, six. There we go. The infamous mark of the beast is right here. Now, remember in verse 18, it says, if you have understanding, if you have wisdom, you're going to know the number. So notice right here, if you're for Bible numerics, you're not considered a fool. You're not considered a weirdo. You're considered wise. Now, I know there's a lot of crazy weird stuff online where people just play with numbers. And actually, to be quite honest, you can make numbers match with all sorts of things. So you got to play carefully with that. And it's because of some foolish people doing that. That's why there are some scholars, Christian scholars, who see that as mere foolishness. Well, both of them are wrong, both the scholar and the foolish person online. Bible nu numerics is a real deal from the Bible, but it's based off of Scripture, not of people playing with numbers. When people play with numbers, that's something you're forcing and not letting God the Holy Spirit reveal from Scripture. So here's something scriptural. We see six is the number of man. That's scriptural. So based off of Bible numerics and the number of Bible verses that you see, everything has a pattern in the Word of God. And when it has a pattern, it's going to show clearly from Scripture. And that's how you can find Bible numerics is based off of that. But another thing right here is that when you have also other Bible believers who study the Bible a lot, if they can agree with you, then we know that you're not just some solo lone wolf making up things as you go. If it's a really wise thing that you discovered, you're going to have a lot of people, especially those who have the same spirit as you, who study the Bible as much as you, the same heart as you, they're going to agree with you. All right? So that's how we, uh, I do Bible numerics is I match it up with other Bible believers. I don't make something up by myself. If there's something the Lord showed to me personally. It is going to come to the agreement of those who share the same love of Jesus as I do, study the Bible as much as I do. So that's important to understand concerning about the mark of the beast system. Okay, now before I jump to Revelation chapter 14, there are a few things I would like to share concerning about 666, which I think that you'd find interesting. It's only in two passages, two passages in your Bible, that the number 666 shows up. So, um, you know what? I'm going to turn to the verses over here. Let's look at 2 Chronicles first. The book of 2 Chronicles chapter 19. 2 Chronicles chapter 19. That's the first mention of where 666 is mentioned. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, excuse me, chapter 9. And then we're going to read verse 13 over here. Notice in King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold, 600 shekels of beaten gold went to one target. So notice over here that as, oh, excuse me, uh, verse 13, uh, wrong verse. <laughs> now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600 and three score and six talents of gold. Now, that matches perfectly with uh, the number 603 score and 6 with the Antichrist number of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. Now, remember during this time, Solomon was sinning by getting uh, wives from pagan nation and then horses from Egypt and multiplying his gold. So you'll notice right here that this is not really a positive thing. Uh, another thing over here is that we're going to look at the book of Ezra chapter 2. Ezra chapter 2, verse 13. Ezra chapter 2. And we'll read verse 13. Now notice the next time that 666 is mentioned in your King James Bible, connected with the Lord of rebellion so that's like almost satanic over there all right we're going to look at the book of ezra chapter 2 and verse 13 the children of adonikam 660 
and six. 660 and six. Let's go to some other gold mines over here concerning about 666 that you probably never thought of before. Dr. Ruckman wrote in his uh, Ruckman Reference Bible, the number 666 is the brand name of a cough syrup. <laughs> How about that? And a highway in Colorado that runs through New Mexico to Salt Lake City. It is the first three digits of the zip codes of Topeka, Kansas. It used to be the area code of Reeves, Louisiana, before it was changed. It is now, it now is supposed to be the area code for some agency in the Department of Defense. The stupid Satanists use it in their worship services. You will also notice that 666, if you look at John chapter 6 verse 66, it deals with disciples who turned away from Jesus Christ and they stopped following him. But you'll also notice that Judas Iscariot is later mentioned on. And the Bible says where Jesus said, one of you is a devil. <laughs> the Antichrist is just around the corner when it comes to 666. You'll notice several cases of that. Some very interesting stuff concerning that number. Also concerning about some people who are wondering if Jared Kushner is the Antichrist. They'll mention about one of his buildings that he has or one of the places that he bought is located on 666. How about that? All right, now let's return to Revelation chapter 14. Let's look at some interesting stuff at the book of Revelation. Now, if you think that the stuff that I talked about was already interesting enough concerning about the mark of the beast at chapter 13, uh, I think Revelation 14 has some more interesting stuff. All right, let's look at the book of Revelation, chapter 14. The Bible says over here, and I looked, so John is looking, and lo, okay, so lo and behold, that's the idea of the word, word lo, lo and behold. And lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Okay, so notice capitalized a lamb, so that's Jesus Christ. Remember John chapter 1? Jesus is called what? The lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. Uh, Revelation chapter 5 and chapter 6, we saw the Lamb, Jesus Christ, introducing himself. So we know this is Jesus Christ. He stood on the Mount Zion. Well, wait a minute, then that means this Mount Zion is located up in heaven. This is not talking about the earthly Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000. Now, remember the 144,000? Those were the ones at Revelation chapter 7. These were the people from the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel selected equally to be known as the 144,000, but they are sealed. Why? Because notice right here, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So these people have God the Father, his name written on their foreheads. Now remember the Antichrist, Satan always wants to imitate God. So then he'll have them have the name written on their foreheads. But then God says, no, I want my name written on your forehead. So it can be very possible when you look at this, having his father's name written in their foreheads, that Satan's going to try to imitate where his name, in some sense, would be written on their foreheads, just like God the Father would. So it may be very possible. Now, one interesting thing about the name of blasphemy on the forehead, which is what I covered before at Revelation 13 about this name of bat blasphemy. What's very possible is it's referring to 666. Why? Because the Pope is wearing a hat. And remember, the Pope is the Antichrist. And this is very plainly shown because he's wearing on his hat, but then because of a lot of uh, Bible-believing preachers who gave the Pope a hard time, uh, they made that more scarce now. But I believe the Latin inscription goes Vicarius Filii Dei. And actually, if you scratch out all the letters over there that are not Roman number numerals, the rest of them are Roman number numerals. And when you calculate all that, you'll calculate to 666. That's what the Pope got written in his forehead, plain as day. So you see more and more the Pope being the Antichrist figure, I see it. But these 144,000, they have the Father's name written on their forehead. And you can see this example at the book of Ezekiel. So I want you all to turn to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at the book of Ezekiel. 
then we'll go to chapter 9. Now notice it talks about these Jews who are marked with the seal of God on their foreheads. Notice right here that Ezekiel chapter 9, notice the word of God reads, in verse 3, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city. Okay, now notice over here it's talking about Jews through the midst of Jerusalem. See, those are definitely Jews. And set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So notice that these are people who witness the abomination that's going on in the city of Jerusalem. And God says, put a mark on them. Why? So that his judgment doesn't fall at verse 5, verse 6 and 7. Now think about this similar case that happened. When you go to Revelation chapter 9, the passage shows that those who have the mark of the beast, they're injured. And then those who have the mark of the father, they're protected. God says, hurt not the earth until we seal the servants of God on their forehead at Revelation chapter 7. So they get divine protection, whereas those who have the mark of the beast, they get injured. They get judged by God. So why? Because they cry about the abominations done in Jerusalem. Wait a minute, abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Matthew 24, that matches with what? The desolation that's going on in Jerusalem. We see that, and that matches perfectly to a T with Revelation chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 9. So these tribulation saints of 144,000, they have the seal, the mark of God, protected by God from God's judgment, God's judgment falls upon the Antichrist people who have the mark of the beast. And also, while under the protection of God's mark, these people are in mourning, in grief, uh, and crying about the abominations that were done by the Antichrist at the city of Jerusalem, which is why God sent his judgment. All right, so sorry about that one. We're going to look at, we're going to return to our main text in Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. I'm getting a lot of stuff coming out of my laptop, so I hope that some of you would excuse that one. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 2. Now, here's the interesting part I notice. And I heard a voice from heaven, just kind of like God speaking from heaven, right? So sometimes he does that. As the voice of many waters... So the voice sounds like many waters rushing to and fro. We've seen that throughout the book of Revelation uh, with a mighty angel and with Jesus Christ throughout the book of Revelation. Their voice sounds like many waters rushing to and fro. And as the voice of a great thunder, it also combines with thunder. That's what his voice sounds like. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Now we got something different. It's not just God speaking as a voice from heaven or perhaps an angel. It's the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Okay, who's the one uh, stringing, strumming the harps? Who are these harpers? Verse 3, And they sung as it were a new song before a throne. So this song is totally brand new, whoever's stringing the, uh, strumming the harps. And they do it in front of God's throne. And before the four beasts, they do it in front of the four beasts, which is the four cherubims, remember? And the elders, they sing this new song in front of the elders. Now look at that. So these 144,000, they're not the same as the 24 elders that we saw. Now the 24 elders, what you're going to notice is that they are the Christian church, which I already explained before, so I'm not going to do that again. But look at this. The Christian church has their own song that's different from the tribulation saints. The tribulation saints have to sing their own song. Look at Revelation chapter 6. Or Revelation 5, excuse me, Revelation chapter 5. Now look at verse 8. It says right over here at 
oh, excuse me, uh, I'm turning to my literal Bible rather than the computer here so that y'all can see. Revelation chapter 5. Notice over here that it reads about the, the 24 elders, what they do. They have their own song to sing. Look at verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four, look at this, and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. These are talking about the twenty-four elders, taking for granted they're the Christian church, having every one of them harps. Well, how about that? Just like the tribulation saints who have their own harps. But look at this, and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. See, those are the tribulation saints who are distinguished from the 24 elders of Christian church. Now look at this, verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou hast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. The 24 elders sing a new song that basically glorifies God for releasing the tribulation while they have escaped the tribulation, a pre-tribulation rapture up in heaven, and also that, that they are redeemed, saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas the tribulation saints, they come through and out of tribulation, and they sung, sing their own song, which is not like the Christian church age at verse 9. That's Christian church doctrine right there, being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ paid it all. But look at the tribulation saint song. It's the song of Moses. Okay, return to Revelation 14. They're very different. They sing a totally different song. Revelation chapter 14, verse 3. They sung a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. See, these people have to sing a totally different song in front of of us Christians. So that's not us. Christians cannot go through the tribulation. Again, the Bible proves over and over again the Christians are not in the tribulation. It's Jews. And no man can learn that song. No one can understand the song they're singing. Not even the saved Christians. So that proves we're distinguished from tribulation saints. We're not the same as them. But the 144,000, only those 144,000 who are marked with God, seal, which were redeemed from the earth. Notice right here, they're redeemed from the earth. This is a little bit more distinguished compared to uh, the 24 elders who are redeemed uh, by God's blood. Why? Because notice over here that they came out of great tribulation from the earth. Now, if you compare that with uh, another passage at Revelation, I believe it can be at chapter 15, they actually sing the song of Moses. So look at Revelation 15, 3. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So notice over here that there's something Jewish connected to the song with these people who are singing uh, the 144,000 with the harps. I mean, look at verse 2. That's them, the 144,000, the ones who've gotten the victory over... The image, the mark of the beast, and they also did not take his seal, and they also have the harps. That perfectly matches with Revelation chapter 14. Okay.